Hi, good morning. This is your host Sandeep Pedneker and you are listening to One Universe, the talk show based on the non-profit One Universe that fosters positivity through the promotion of love, peace and harmony. We have had uh, Judge Greg Gilbert on our show and he has come again on the show to talk about some wonderful changes uh, that he's incorporating, others have incorporated, and things that are being done for the benefit of our community. So welcome to the show once again, Jeff. Thank you for having me again, Sandeep. I yes, sir. You. So uh, there are a few things uh, that you wanted to talk about. So, yeah, please. So every day when I'm in court, um, there's, there's a couple of things that come up in court routinely. People don't seem to understand the process, or victims won't come to court because uh, they believe that any help they get is sort of tied to their participating in the court system, and that's not, not necessarily true. Um, and so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about uh, traditionally domestic violence has been something that um, the court saw as a family matter, mm -hmm. and those cases were not prosecuted at all. They were completely ignored by the court system. Um, and luckily, I think beginning in the 1990s, particularly, uh, the law began to recognize that just because you know your abuser or your assailant, um, that the law shouldn't treat you any differently. In fact, the law has sort of, the ball has kind of rolled in the other direction and recognized that, that when you're connected to your abuser or someone who, assail, who, who rapes, robs, whatever the crime may be, uh, when you know that person, you're actually maybe in a more precarious mm -hmm. uh, situation than you are than if, if the person's a stranger. Uh, certainly a lot more danger. Uh, most of my victims uh, in my cases that I see before me get contacted by their, uh, the, the person accused. And it may be, it may be uh, nefarious. It may be that they want to prevent them from coming to court. But it may be as simple as they just want to apologize. But uh, the law now recognizes that all of those, those processes are coercive. Uh, it's not a pleasant process. In fact, it's against the interests of the victim to come to court sometimes because they know they can get hurt. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the protections. The law does sort of has implemented some protections for domestic violence victims and services that are available, and they're not necessarily tied to the participating in the court, court system. I know victims very often, um, they're, they're actually brought into the court system because the uh, call to police. There's been a 911 call by them or by a third party. And so they think that, that any help that they can get is tied to their participation in that process. And that's simply not true. Um, in, uh, let me see here. I want to say back around 1998, that's when the law really uh, got the ball rolling. The con our constitution was amended and it incorporated certain rights that victims have uh, with uh, the court process. And uh, so I always, I want victims to know that they, they can't, uh, they don't have to come to court and feel like they're overwhelmed by it. Mm. It's a confusing process. Uh, a lot of the things that we do in court don't make, uh, they don't make a lot of sense to me sometimes, particularly when, I know when someone from the outside, uh, but vic victims should know that the, the Bill of Rights, the uh, Victims' Rights in Tennessee, has about 10, 10 provisions. Uh, I, I took some notes here. Uh, a victim has a right to confer with the prosecution uh, on every case. Uh, they have a right to reach out and, and, and talk to the prosecution. They have a right to be free from intimidation from the court process, which uh, very often if you come to my courtroom, uh, you would think that defense attorneys, that's their goal, is to harass and intimidate victims when they get them on the stand. And I try to protect victims from that. Um, certainly there's difficult questions sometimes, but the process doesn't have to be abusive. Um, you have a right to be present at, in the courtroom whenever the defendant is present. The mm -hmm. victim has a right to be there, to see what's going on, that it, it's, it's not a hide-the-ball kind of thing. Um, they have a right to be heard at all critical stages. Uh, for instance, at a sentencing hearing, certainly the victim's uh, desires, a judge would want to know and has to know what the victim wants. Um, and, you know, bail setting or bail hearings when requests to, re to reduce bail. We always attempt to reach out to victims before any of those decisions are made because the Constitution says we have to. Um, so talking about uh, mm -hmm. one example that you yes. provided is that 
they can come and they can see and hear what's going on. Absolutely. But uh, they are also safeguarded that they are brought in separately. They don't have to come through the same. Yes, that's a very good point. Uh, in fact, it, gosh, it wasn't until too many years ago that we actually did have victims and defendants. Well, it's still a, a weak point. They come in the same through the same doors of mm -hmm. security because they can't run at each other. But our, we have witness coordinators who come in from the district attorney's office and they will escort them back to a witness room so mm -hmm. they don't have to sit either in the courtroom or outside the courtroom waiting for their hearing. Um, they have, they're separate. They don't have to be, <clears throat> they have, they're not going to be harassed by the defendant, which believe me, I've, over the years before we had witness uh, uh, facilities, I saw it happen many times. And it still happens sometimes, but um, it's much safer than it was before, much more comfortable than it used to be. And it can also be just by look, it could be intimidating. Yes, exactly. And that's the, th that's the thing that people don't understand. When, when uh, uh, the abuser knows their vic the victim and they're close to them, it is a, something as simple as a look or a glance, a, a so. glance anything yeah. can be intimidating because they know that person probably better than anyone on earth. And uh, luckily the law and our processes are beginning to recognize and catch up uh, with, with these problems that occur every day down here at the courthouse. Um, and uh, it's, what's surprising is there, there are a couple of other things uh, with the victim's rights. Um, there's a right to notice. Anytime any critical decision is made, the witness coordinators from the district attorney's office have to contact the victim, at least make an effort to let them know what has happened. So it's critical. Um, I want victims to understand that once the court process has started, and if you do want to participate, certainly you have every right and every power to do so. And I want to encourage them to stay in touch with the district attorney's office, even if you've relocated. Make sure um, the district attorney, they're not going to share your personal information right. with, with uh, the, the defendants or the accused. And they want to know what, what's, what you think. And they want to know when you're coming to court, uh, if you're not going to be able to come to court. Um, and we understand there's, there's children involved, and a lot of times you can't just take off work in an instant. And it's better if you let everyone know on the front end. Uh, it certainly makes things a lot easier on, on the victim or you, um, but it also makes it a lot easier on the court system, and everyone uh, goes into it with clear eyes and knows what, what's going on. So communicating with the witness coordinators with the district attorney's office is a critical, critical thing, mm -hmm. and it shouldn't be intimidating. In fact, if it is, they need to remember they have rights and they can stand up and say, I don't like what's going on or I want you to explain to me um, what's going on. And then they can talk to yeah. you. Yes, and then they, if, if necessary, I can get involved because uh, I'm ultimately the protector of their rights in the courtroom for sure. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things that I really want victims to know. Uh, one limitation that victims have, which I think in a domestic violence case is sometimes reassuring is the ultimate decision is with the prosecutor, surprisingly. Uh, the judge doesn't necessarily, I'm there as a referee. If there is a trial or a hearing, I sentence, make the decision of those kinds of things. But the decision to actually prosecute is with the prosecutor. prosecutor. Okay. So almost every day I have uh, someone come in my court, and it's an accused, and they'll tell me, well, I don't, I don't want to hire an attorney. I don't, I don't really want to come back to court. I want to, I, the victim wants to drop the charges. And that, that phrase, dropping charges, is really not a thing. Uh, you see it on television. Uh, certainly, uh, as we now know, the law says that the prosecutor does have to consider what the victim wants. Mm -hmm. But the ultimate decision, they can go forward uh, without the cooperation of the victim. And that's where sometimes I have to step in. If the prosecutor demands that a witness uh, who's been served with a subpoena comes to court and they're not showing up, I can send sheriff's deputies out to pick them up and bring them to court, and, okay. and they'll be sitting in jail till the next day. They might get a bond set, so it's a it's a very serious process, and that that is one limit that one limitation. Um, so you can't tell the prosecutor what to do, but my experience is with prosecutors, they have so many cases, and every case is different. They want to know what the victim has to say, and they will um, they will fashion a remedy that may not involves jail time or time at the uh, Shelby County Correctional Facility, involves probation. Um, the, uh, the, the new district attorney, Mulroy, has made a big effort to do a lot of pre-prosecution 
uh, counseling, individual counseling. If, if offenders or the accused um, will go to individual counseling, go to batterers intervention classes, uh, and show that they've made a real effort to do those things, they'll ultimately dismiss the charges. So uh, there are things that will that can be done without the victim having to send their offender to, to prison. Um, I know a lot of a lot of victims are concerned about that because they have kids together. They, you know, they may need the financial support. Um, so it's w the courts, prosecutors, the defense attorneys. They they know, uh, you know, what kinds of things the district attorney is willing to do. They'll take those kinds of remedies to their client, and they'll. The negotiations are very different than in a lot of the other courtrooms, and I'm kind of proud of that because we don't just seek jail time. We seek something that's going to improve the long term, and that's the goal. And um, so I guess the idea that the prosecutor uh, can proceed without your cooperation can be sort of intimidating, mm. but if you accept that, it takes that burden off the, the victim, the victim. And, and they can say, it's not my fault you're being prosecuted. It's your behavior that you've done this thing and the prosecution's going to make this decision. I'm not involved with this. And so... Uh, try to make the offenders in court understand that, that it, it technically doesn't do any good to go back and intimidate the victims because the prosecutor, if they've got the evidence and they want to go to court, well, they, if they can do it. So, so it's based um, mostly on mm -hmm. evidence that the It really is, and I guess that's, that's the one limitation. The, the, the biggest problem is, is if, if a, a victim wants something to happen but they're afraid and they never contact, never reach out, never respond to calls, letters, subpoenas. The district attorney uh, has no power. They, can, they can't do anything at all if they can't prove it in court. And so while they may, um, you know, there, there's, there's been some advances in technology. We have videos everywhere mm, now. You're right, right. Um, so it may be that a prosecutor could go uh, forward Possibly, if a victim didn't didn't testify, but those are really exceptional circumstances, and the law has a thing uh, that's called um, the right to confront your accuser. Uh, anytime you have a witness against you, uh, the law presumes that that witness is going to take the stand and be subject to cross examination by a defense attorney. Right. So um, a lot of the things that are available will bolster a prosecution if the victim comes into court. There'll be video to back up their story. Mm -hmm. There'll be other witnesses who heard them tell their story before uh, before going to law enforcement that can be used to bolster their testimony uh, to make them more believable. Uh, but it does still, 99% of the time, the victim is still going to have to come to court and testify. And that's the one really, in, really intimidating thing I know is coming to court uh, and the second that they see their their abuser, you can see it on their face, they're terrified. And they'll ask, do I have to be in court with them? Yes, that's another thing. The, the law presumes, or the law says that anytime you're accused of a crime, you have a right uh, to confront in any proceeding. You are never excluded from the proceedings if you're the accused. Right, right. Uh, but again, the flip side is that, um, you know, if the evidence is there um, and the case is strong, juries generally do the right thing. They, they do what uh, what the evidence leads them to. And if the evidence isn't strong, there's also al alternatives. Maybe they can do counseling and a dismissal of the charges. So I think in the end, it's really to the benefit of the victim to always at least communicate with the prosecutors and the court system and let them know what their position is. And, you know, remedies can be fashioned that can be less intrusive to them. The problem is if they don't communicate at all, and the worst case scenario is when the DA tells me they have a witness who was personally subpoenaed, they were served, which means they're ordered to court, mm -hmm. but they've never called, they never contacted, and it puts me in a position if they ask me to pick that person up and arrest them. I don't like to do that. Right. Uh, because it's just a witness. Right, it's just yeah. a witness. It's yeah. an exceptional circumstance. It's, it's inherent that a court, obviously, if people, if no one came to court, we shouldn't have a court system. So... I do have that power to arrest people and bring bring them into custody, maybe find them in contempt for not coming to court. But that is an exceptional, a really exceptional. Uh, I don't think I've done it this year. Uh, it's been a long time. <clears throat> and it has to be a really serious case. 
uh, and very serious circumstances with lots of lots of other reports involving the parties before I'll even consider uh, trying to do something. We try to reach out to the victims many times before we, we, we that's sort of the... So when, when it comes to the number of cases that you handle, mm -hmm. how many cases come to the court to you? Right. How many cases are the ones that are handled by uh, the district attorney mm -hmm. and his office? And how many are the ones that are pre um, just So uh, the, uh, I would say... There's been a real push with uh, with uh, um, General Mulroy to really do uh, counseling, which we in the past had done in the court, but even more so now. So I think it's a very good thing. It's a huge yes. It's yeah. a huge percentage of the cases. I, you know, actual convictions in our court is a very small percentage. Less than ten percent actually get. Convicted. That is not a bad thing at all. Yes, it's, particularly if it's just uh, if the charges are you know routine assaults. Now when you when you when people are being shot, people are getting killed, people are getting raped, uh, I think those are, the, more, this, serious. Those are more serious than those. Yeah. But I don't see the district attorney dismissing those for counseling. It's the it's the slaps, the pushes. The, uh, the majority of the cases I have are people in relationships that are frayed. They're in a relationship where maybe the relationship is ending. Uh, they still have kids trying to smooth out all of the complications and unfortunately a lot of people just misbehave uh, in those circumstances and so I think the court system can be a vehicle to end those relationships do it without um, without violence and get them on good footing and send them on so they don't have to come back to the court system uh, that's at least that's my goal yeah I, as as, as um normal person, mm -hmm. a citizen, I think that these changes that have been brought about, uh, that you are implementing, the mm -hmm. DA is implementing, are really good. So kudos to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. We're trying. Uh, we realize that the relationships, well, the, the biggest thing to me is their children in these relationships, and they learn from what they observe, and we'll just be creating a new generation. So we've got to stop that cycle uh, not only is, is domestic violence a cycle of violence in between the parties, but it's a, it's a generational cycle of violence. So that's the goal, just to slow those things down. So how many times has it happened that the, the victim has provided some things in? Mm -hmm. um, how often do prosecutors actually verify whatever has been presented is factual or not? You mean, do they... Uh, have evidence to corroborate or uh, correct okay. do, do do the prosecutors actually corroborate that evidence that is provided by the victim before they bring the case to the court generally so the the the, uh, the prosecutor's office is not really an investigative agency the all the evidence is brought to them by a law enforcement agency 90 percent of the cases come from Memphis police <clears throat> small smaller percentage come from Shelby County oh, Sheriff's yeah, Department, okay. and then you can have some. Uh, we have we have outlying jurisdictions: Collierville, Millington, Bartlett. Mm -hmm. If someone exercises their right to a jury trial, it is sent down. Uh, but those those come in after the indictment process. So I don't see the suburban cases on my docket. Okay. <clears throat> but um, nowadays, the the law enforcement is really good. It could always be better uh, because there's limited resources because I don't think there's a case, uh, an incident that occurs today that a, some sort of video camera doesn't catch. Now, Memphis police are really good about getting standard. We always get, you can get 911 calls. Those are routinely available. Videos uh, like body cam videos, those are available on every right. case. So now, yeah. And so body you get the it. on the scene, you may not get the actual incident, but you've got the immediate aftermath. And so you've got the victim telling exactly what happened. You get the raw emotion, the videos there to corroborate any witnesses that are that were there who speak to the officers will be. Uh, statements in the past would have been taken, but now you actually have statements uh, again on the scene. So Body cam has really changed the name of the game in prosecution, um, and you can really there's a lot of corroborating evidence there. Um, and MPD is really good about if it's a rape case uh, that all the victims go to the sexual assault uh, resource center. They usually have some sort of physical exam. Uh, physical evidence is taken during the course of it, and that's available if it's a, a rape or sexual assault. Mm -hmm. um, so there's generally. 
um, you know, the burden of proof at a trial is beyond a reasonable doubt. And so um, that's a really high burden. Um, but usually the officers do a very good job of getting the evidence that's immediately available. And um, <clears throat> if they're aware that maybe someone has a ring doorbell, they follow up, gotcha. try to get that, mm -hmm. that information. Uh, if it's in a uh, kind of gosh, fair number of cases where it happens at a gas station and there's the gas station video has it. So officers are really good about being trained to, to pull that information and to bolster the case. Um, there's physical, if you strangle someone, that's an interesting because that's a common way to assault someone. And on the surface, a lot of times you can't tell that they've been strangled. But with an ALS light, under black light, you can see the, the, the blood that's close to the skin and you can document someone who's been recently strangled. Um, <clears throat> uh, Memphis police are very good about using the LS light to find that kind of information. So there's a lot of things that are done by investigators, for sure. Okay. Very nice. Mm -hmm. So uh, there were a few more things that you wanted oh, yeah. to talk about. Yeah. Um, let me see. I my notes here. Uh, the, uh, uh, one of the things that the law has sort of recognized uh, when when you when a victim comes to the system who is related to their, their abuser, the officer on the scene is obligated to um, to sit with them, explain the services that are available to them. Um, there's a process called an order of protection. It's really a civil it's through the civil courts, mm -hmm. but it's a process where you can get an actual court order to order someone to stay away from you. And a lot of victims, that's what they want. They want the relationship to end. They don't necessarily want someone to go to prison, the criminal process, but they love to get an order of protection to, to make that firm stamp that I don't want you around me, stay away from me. And the law now uh, allows uh, law enforcement officers to pursue that process immediately after they take the report on the scene. The victim doesn't have to then wait a day or two and go to court and swear in front of a judge and uh, take several days for it to happen, the officer can actually start the initiation of that process for them so they can stay home if they've got to relocate to other housing, they've got kids that got to go to school, uh, you know, I don't know, their, their abuser has vandalized the car, they've got to get the car repaired. That happens quite often. Mm. Um, and so the law uh, uh, will allow officers in that circumstance to actually get the order of protection. The law uh, requires... <clears throat> because timing is so critical for victims to, to even maybe move out. Uh, if it's a domestic assault charge, there's a 12-hour hold. If it's an aggravated assault, meaning there it's is... It's a 12-hour hold for what? For, before they can be released. When they're picked up on the war, okay. Uh, okay. they cannot be released for 12 hours. Uh, <clears throat> so that give the, the victim time to get their affairs in order, to move out of the house, mm -hmm. or whatever right. needs to be done. If it's an aggravated assault, which, which means there's a deadly weapon, serious bodily injury, or strangulation, then there's a 24-hour hold. So it doesn't matter if, if they make their bond immediately or if the judge agreed to ROR them, um, then they're going to stay in custody for at least 24 hours. Uh, so the victim has that those processes in place. And <clears throat> the officers now, through the lethality assessment program on the scene, uh, they'll ask a series of questions, and if the victim is really at high risk, they will connect them with an advocate over the phone who mm -hmm. can, can really explain these processes, offer services, tell them where to go, the Family Safety Center uh, or the Women's Advocacy Center in the, in the suburbs to get help. Um, so the law has really uh, come around from, from ignoring family violence to actually recognizing that there's maybe some extra protections that need to be in place to better help the victims of these cases and not just to help the prosecution. That's the thing. When I was a young prosecutor, I felt like, well, all this is done so that we can prosecute somebody and send them to prison. Mm. And, I, and now I realize, well, you know, that's, that's really just one of the deterrents uh, is to incarcerate someone, but really that... Once the police are called, there's a sign that there's a major problem. Uh, there's something really wrong in this relationship. Uh, if it's going to continue, there's, it's going to have to be with major changes. And so you've called the police. Services are available. You don't have to continue on with the court process. I encourage you to do it because I think, uh, what's the old rule? How do you, how do you uh, fight a bully? 
is you stand up to them. You know, it's just yeah. that it's just simple stuff. And I think a lot of these uh, abusers in court, you can see when the when the victim actually finally shows up and walks through the, the court doors, their eyes become like saucers because they're shocked that this person is actually coming to court. Coming so and standing up against yes. yeah. Yes. So I encourage victims to to prosecute. Uh, to cooperate, but if even if they don't, uh, they can take that left turn and just go to services, get an order of protection. Uh, it, at least there's there's things, tools available to help them overcome this relationship. Either either empower them to fix the relationship or walk away from it. Um, but the worst thing I think is for victims to think that this the whole process once you call police or law enforcement that. It's intimidating. They don't want to be involved after that process. I, if, I think if they stopped and really understood how the system works, it's there to help them, but it does require them to participate. You're right. So, um, you, you, based on what you just said, mm -hmm. and, and I'm, I'm, I'm just in awe of, and of course I know this, mm -hmm. but I want um, everybody to know that the changes that have been brought about mm -hmm. are to see to it that that it, it comes out to be a positive for the community at large. Yes. And also to reduce the stress on the DA's office and the prosecutors. Right. Uh, their intention is definitely not to see that, oh, our workload has to reduce or minimize. But their intention is to see that the perpetrators uh, see to it that they don't do it again. Right. Now, you and I serve on uh, the Domestic Violence and Sexual uh, Task Force. Yes. And in one of those things, uh, a person from the pre-trial services gave an example mm -hmm. that one of the perpetrators said, I don't know why I'm here. So he did not know that he had committed a so-called crime. <laughs> and and so uh -huh. for, for pre-trial services, they, they realized that people are really not in a position... Either they are not educated, right. they do not know, they are dumb, mm -hmm. or it, it is that over a period of time, when they were brought up, it, that was not supposed to be a right. crime, but now it is. It is. And people, if people have a hard time. They, they want to believe that that old system is in place because it's, exactly. it's my family. Uh, and domestic violence, it, it's a crime of control. Uh, it really is. And so uh, there are, we definitely have abusers who come in who just really cannot accept that the court system or that the community, I like to say the community more because it, it's really all of us, not just True. the court, yeah. who have suddenly we've gotten our attention because your relationship is is gotten so bad and they don't they, they don't accept that they've done anything wrong. Um, and so I think that's a lot of it. People just think that this is my family. This happens inside my house. And right, it's, and it's, it's none of your, your business. business but when the police start getting called and when children are, are, are witnessing this, uh, it becomes everybody's problem. Yeah. Um, and and um, the, the, the fact is that with the pre-trial example and what mm -hmm. you're saying, and we're discussing this, the idea is to, of course, people don't know. We need to educate the victims. We need yes. to educate the perpetrators. And of course, this is one of the way right. we're taking this message. So ladies and gentlemen, please, when you see this video, please forward it to others so that everybody knows that, you know what? Now there are ways that was were not things that were in the past. Things have changed. Uh, the way we look at things, the way we handle law uh, and enforcement are different. Yes. So uh, I, I definitely thank you mm -hmm. for the introduction of new things that you are doing in you know, the court system as well as the district attorney. Mm -hmm. But I want you to continue with some of the points that you had. Oh, sure, sure. And one thing I'd like to mention is I'd like to thank you because one of the one of the when it comes to services to to um, to help victims escape violence. Obviously, housing is the is the, the number one issue. It is yes. they live with this abuser who helps them pay the rent or pays all the rent, and they really feel uh, trapped. And so, getting housing services is really difficult. It's expensive. Taxpayers can't pay. The, the need is much greater than the resources. But the work that you're doing with the task force to help get 
more and more housing available, that in, it, it in, emboldens victims to be able to stand up to their accusers and walk away. So thank, thank you for you. that. Yes, thank you. Thank you for appreciating that. Now let me ask yep. you this. Um, let me take mm -hmm. a situation that the, let us say, the, the man in the relationship mm -hmm. uh, owns the home right. uh, but is abusive right. and she brings in restraining order against him. Yes. And that is the only house. What happens to him when he's not allowed to come? That's that's a good question. That's a very good question. That happens because it happens uh, routinely. My, my bond conditions on every case, I order no contact. And the law says that I have the power not only to set the bond, but set the conditions of the bond. Mm -hmm. And so I can make him wear a GPS. I can make him move out of the house. Uh, I can actually uh, uh, temporarily... Uh, and his child custody visitations effectively by saying he can't communicate with, with the mother. Um, and the law says I can do that, and I re routinely do it. And I, I ask people, you know, you're promising not to go around this victim. Where are you going to stay? And it's, it's their problem to figure out. Um, and, you know, I don't know how it gets resolved. Uh, very often we do have offenders. They need to get their clothes and those kinds of things. Memphis Police Department and Shelby County Sheriffs have been pretty good in the past about uh, if they reach out to the police, police precinct and say, look, I've, I've been ordered to move out of my house. I need to get my things. Officers will go over there with them, make contact with the victim, explain to them what's going on. And if she's amicable to letting him go in, and that way the, the abuser is, is able to facilitate moving out without any contact. Uh, but it is a, it's a it's a thorny subject because it gets really complicated, and and I get the well I pay the rent I should be able to live there yeah but uh, not in Tennessee uh, if you if you are accused of abusing someone unfortunately you're gonna have to move out of the house, and okay. same with orders of protection same powers uh, with, in the civil process when you're asking for an order of protection uh, the judge has the same power they order no contact and if that includes having to move out it so does. That's the way it is. And how long? Uh, to, through the uh, throughout the proceedings, um, <clears throat> until the case is resolved, that be a year those or conditions two? are placed. Yes. Now the judge always has the right to to modify those conditions, and mm -hmm. it's not uncommon for us to say if if, if they're in a strange uh, relationship and they're going to go through a divorce, it's going to take time, and they will agree. One will move out, and the other will, will move to a new location or whatever, um, but. But the standing order is no contact, and if you're living together, you're not living together on my bond conditions. Um, that's just the way it is. And usually, how much is the bond set for? Uh, bond can be anywhere. So even in, even on a release on your own recognizance, you don't have to post any cash bond, but there's still conditions of release, and that would in include those conditions. But bond can go up as high as sky's the limit. I mean, I guess it's unusual to see a million-dollar bond, but... Um, in Tennessee, a hundred thousand dollar bond is a high bond. It's considered a high right. bond because uh, the, the <clears throat> legislature says if you if you are going to come up with a hundred thousand dollars, which would be ten thousand in cash, you're going to have to show the court that it's from a legitimate source. So you can't have just drug proceeds or stolen car proceeds paying. <laughs> yeah. And so anything over a hundred thousand dollars gets to be very serious because you have to prove it's from a legitimate source. Right, and so, that's based on. Uh, the crime that was committed. It depends, it's, based, yeah. it's based on, there's lots of different factors uh, that the law has to consider. The, the main overarching things is bond is set, most importantly, to make sure you come back to court, uh, that you don't just skip out of town. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also done to protect the community. And actually, that's one of my points in mm -hmm. my, uh, my notes. Uh, uh, Tennessee law also says that with regard to domestic violence cases, you don't just consider a general harm to the community. You have to consider harm to that specific victim in that okay. case that you're setting the bond uh, under 4011-150 uh, is a statute code. <clears throat> and it's really critical that judges not only consider not just are you going to come back to court, but if you're out of custody and related to your your uh alleged victim, mm -hmm. you're more likely to contact them, you're more likely to reoffend, um, and so bond is, is meant to also keep the victim safe. Okay. And, and you gave an example of um, somebody um, accused saying mm -hmm. that, oh, I don't want an attorney. Right. So in that case, now you mentioned a statute. Mm -hmm. He is unaware of, 
of that. So how he is using his just basic knowledge to say, oh, I did this, I did that, and I shouldn't be whatever mm -hmm. his case may be. If he is not willing to, or he thinks that he doesn't need an attorney, so how would you handle that? We have situation? very few people who come through our system who do it without an attorney. <clears throat> now the Constitution says that a person has an absolute right to proceed without an attorney. Mm -hmm. The, the problem is an ethical standard sort of recognize you've got someone who's probably never been to law school. They don't know courtroom procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes years and years and years to learn rules of evidence. Um, and so if someone comes in and talks to me and, and says that they, they don't want an attorney, I have to ask them. There's a, there's a litany of questions. I ask them if they understand, and I discourage them from doing it. Uh, <clears throat> and so... Every once in a while, we'll have someone who ultimately decides they want to re represent themselves, and it never comes out really. The process just gets dragged out, in my experience, when someone tries to represent themselves. Uh, the court really has to work a lot harder to protect their rights, and it's much easier for their rights to get violated because they don't know mm, what's going exactly, on. Exactly, yeah. And so, but actually, that's a very tiny percentage of cases. Most of the cases, and we have a wonderful uh, public defender's office here in Shelby County, and with the bulk of my offenders are not high income. And so a huge percentage qualify for the public defender. So I can appoint the public defender and they at least have an attorney who can at least explain these things and <clears throat> the process and, and uh, consequences of going to trial and all those things. A couple of questions. Mm -hmm. One, um, can anybody ask for an elbow attorney? Um, the law presumes, basically, I think that, that if you decide to go, let's say you decide you want to go pro se, you don't want an attorney, the court is still going to try to appoint an elbow counsel for you because mm -hmm. it's such a critical thing that you need. Um, it would be like to try to fight a war, I don't know, a modern warfare with a knife. You just, you're just going to be, right, you're right, going to be right, yeah. uh, at a huge disadvantage. Yeah. So uh, uh, usually I will try to appoint elbow counsel and every once in a while, you still have uh, the the person who wants to go for say, well, I don't want that at all, I don't want that at all. And I say, well, I'll appoint them anyway. They're available to you, and they'll be here. And inevitably, they end up talking to the attorney, and it ends up becoming okay, representation. Good, good. Yeah. good. So, and, and when, um, in, in that very small, maybe 0.01% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of cases, when you, you mentioned that, oh, they could be taken advantage of, mm -hmm. and when you see that, now he is at a loss. He right. He should have said this, this, mm -hmm. these things. Right. And he doesn't know, so yeah. he's not doing. Do you come into the picture and say, well, or do you let it go and let? That's where it gets very tricky because uh, one of the one of the foundations of of our criminal justice system is you should be free from self incrimination. Uh, that you should never be compelled to admit anything that you have an attorney who speaks for you so that you won't accidentally. And I have never seen someone who represent themselves who didn't inadvertently say something that's incriminating. They will just put their foot right in it and they don't realize what they've done. Uh, I, I haven't noticed that the, the prosecution will necessarily try to take advantage of them. It's that they make these critical errors that put themselves in a terrible position. And so it's usually it's their ineptitude that ends up being right. their worst enemy. Right. Yes. So, but then then do you take it upon yourself well, to point out? I, or? And I have to. And, and in fact, the, the law says when I'm explaining to them all these things, I have to tell them I can't step in and help you. I'm okay. got to hold you to the same standard. So um, I maybe after the fact I can stop them and say, "Well, you you've just done something that you probably you are going to regret." Have, yeah. Do you want to rethink this? Uh, and that's probably what I would do outside the presence of any kind of jury or anything like that. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, if, if they do it, you can't, I can't hold their hand. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, know this. You need to understand this. <laughs> yes. So, better hire an attorney. Yes. Yeah. So, please uh, proceed with oh, yes, yes. some yes. of the points. Yeah. I think I've gotten most of my points. Yeah. I think the, the one, the biggest point that I want to make is that. Uh, calling law enforcement is is not um, does not mean that you've got to follow through the court system to the end. Um, that that there are ways to step out of the process. But if you communicate with the prosecutors, let them know what your desires are. 
or if you just uh, you know call the police and at least call the Family Safety Center where that's where orders of protections are initiated. Um, I really think that the, at the point where someone is calling law enforcement because their relationship is getting into these violent outbursts, um, it is time to maybe consider doing an order of protection. You've got to do something. Something's got to happen. So um, uh, I guess that the, the call to 911, which is the start of almost every, every criminal case that I have on my docket, um, is it's the way the process is initiated, but it's not necessarily the way that the process has to end. Right. And so I, I just would encourage everyone to, uh, if you're in the city of Memphis, call the Family Safety Center. It's 1750 uh, Union Avenue. Mm -hmm. There's a crisis hotline. If you look it up, it's uh, familysafetycenter.org. And the crisis hotline number is 901 800 6064. And then. So, please repeat that, yes. those numbers. Yes. So, it's uh, the crisis hotline is area code 901 800 6064. And that's the Family Safety Center. It's mm -hmm. located at 1750 Madison Avenue. Um, they start the initiation of the criminal, uh, of the civil, I'm sorry, the orders of protection process. And then they have representatives of all the services available, housing, uh, you know, if you need housing, if you need child care, uh, if there's anything that you need to relo relocate out of town, whatever. Uh, I can't tell you there's unlimited funds, but I would bet you they're going to get you started on a road where mm -hmm. you, you can get there. Right, okay. uh, and again, the, the crisis number, 901-800-6064. In the suburbs, it's the Women's Advocacy Center. Um, and the wonderful woman, Miss Ramona Jackson, has a, a, a nonprofit. She's done this on her own. She was an attorney, uh, and, and I think she was called uh, almost religious calling to, to help victims of domestic violence. So she helps Collierville, Germantown, Millington, Bartlett, all those uh, suburban, all the victims uh, can get connected through law enforcement with her agency. And uh, her number uh, there, it's 901 eight nine six nine zero five five that's the women's advocacy center uh the the website is women's advocacy center dot org org and again the direct number there is nine oh one eight nine six nine zero five five thank you thank you uh, ladies and gentlemen we definitely want you to avail of these wonderful services that are being offered and um of course we do not want you to be in a situation where you have to avail of these services. Um, so educate yourself, educate your perpetrator. Tell him that, you know what, you could be in trouble, whoever, it's he or she, no matter what. Everybody does mistakes. Uh, mostly there are men who um, end up... Unfortunately, yeah, that's true. That is true. So uh, immaterial of that, um, our intentions are to educate you Please forward this video to your family, friends, and post it on Facebook, uh, Twitter. Uh, you can just take the link and, and post the link. Um, so uh, we, of course, want to thank you, Judge. Mm -hmm. uh, you are doing a wonderful job. And I'm not saying this just because I know you personally, not because I'm here in front of you. But uh, you are showcasing what wonderful things you are the changes that you're bringing about in our community for the benefit of our people so thank you so much thank you thank you for having me yes of course so and uh, ladies and gentlemen we will have judge gilbert uh, again and again uh, to talk about many more issues that we have and some of the issues we have already talked about we might go in depth so you know more about it so thank you once again judge and thanks to you until next time, have a wonderful time. And when you tune into our show, know that we are going to be talking about something positive that impacts our community to foster positivity and promote love, peace and harmony. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.